oh, these are the seven different products. This is what my empire is going to look like. That is easy. <laughs> but in order to bring one of those components to life, you have to do nothing but think and work on that one thing for a prolonged period of time. I think this is the gold mine that is sitting on. Group coaching and training individuals on how to create micro agencies achieves the same goal, except instead of us being an agency, we are a trainer of micro agencies. Which game do you want to play? Do you want to be managing a hundred different clients all wanting different things, or do you want to be educating 100 individuals on how to fulfill that demand? It's very hard for many people to wrap their head around what you just said. If there's one meta takeaway from us doing these lessons every single week, it's like awareness of the lesson doesn't necessarily mean you're going to change it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, great episode, cool. I'm still going to grind all weekend. What's your fastest path to 10 grand a month? It's... Boom. Welcome back to another episode of the Espresso Hour. Week 14. Years flying by yet again. Today, we are going to do a little bit of a deep dive into our goals for the next five weeks. I was, I, I've had this <laughs> list here of setting goals through the end of May and... Uh, because the way we think about the year is December, Jan, Feb is kind of its own little sprint. And then March, April, May, its own little thing. That makes the summer, June, July, August. I like that versus, because mm-hmm. um, the year ends with Black Friday Yeah, is part of the reason I said that. But in writing these, these started as like 10 week goals. And I feel like they've slowly just gone like one week and now it's six weeks until the end of and the period we, I was originally going to set. Yeah, set the, the irony is we're going to set these six-week goals, and then two weeks from now, we're going to be like, wait, wait, what, what? were all the six-week goals? <laughs> so it's all part of the process. Yeah, well, that is one thing I'm trying to get better at, and this is the topic of the episode, is how we look at setting goals across the different business lines, the growth we've had in that process, because for the first time, I think, really over in the last three years, we're looking at these as different businesses mm-hmm. in the way we approach them rather than, hey, we have this run, one writing business. What are all the things we're trying to do with it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the the four businesses, well, we have three core businesses right now. And then there's a fourth of that we're going to be building later this year. But the three core are Ship 30, which is in a point of transition right now. PGA, which is our premium ghostwriting academy, which is our primary right now. And then right with AI, which is a our paid newsletter, and that's the smallest one, but it's also but it's become a meaningful mm-hmm. you know pillar in our in our business. Um, and then the fourth one is the back end of PGA. We basically started with a a beta. We call it like a beta cohort. It's not really a cohort, but like a beta group um, of people that have been in uh, that the mastermind component, the back end component of PGA, and even just having you know what eight people in there mm-hmm. has taught us so much. I, I continue coming back to whenever someone says, I have this product idea, what do you think? I just say, go get five to 10 mm-hmm. people in it. It will teach you so much about running it, what's gonna go into it, how you make those people successful. So we're gonna spend a lot of this, the back half of this year building uh, that product. Yeah, so in setting these goals, we look at each business and then, look, I'm gonna preface this. I'm by no means an expert with this. I probably set either too ambitious or too many, or uh, I do most of this wrong. I'm trying to get better at it. But I look at each business with one high level goal. And then, and that's one number, like a quantifiable, we should be able to say success or failure based on hitting that one number. Mm -hmm. And then marketing sales and success is kind of the three pillars that lead into that number in some way, shape or form. Right now, PGA is the easiest one to set goals for because it already exists. We have a year's worth of data of every one of these numbers and we know the exact formula to get it to a certain level, Mm -hmm. right? So you want to start with that one? Well, and also uh, just the thing to double click on is, so the three pillars underneath a component of the business and that one goal, you know, marketing, sales, and success, the ideal is realizing that you can and should hire one plus person for each one of those. Mm -hmm. And whenever, you know, when we've done this exercise, we've done it multiple times in the past, but this is when it's become the most visceral is like recognizing for ourselves that you and I are still playing Mm -hmm. one or two or three of those roles, which should immediately signal to, to you, you know, that if you're the one running it, that's a primary bottleneck. Mm -hmm. You know, the framework I've heard for this is having one throat to choke for each number. 
uh, which is one person responsible for it. And so it's, as I was setting this, I'm choking myself throughout this entire uh -huh. process because at least in PGA, like we have team members who are operating at these high levels, but they're st we're still in the management of uh -huh. each of these numbers, right? So why don't we start with how we think about this goal, PGA. We have a pretty ambitious goal to hit 100 enrollments per month. We've been at around a 60 to 70 student run rate now for the last year. And recognizing that that additional 30%, 30 35 percent is meaningful in that it requires us to scale the sales team, find new marketing channels, and eventually scale the success team because we'll be having more people joining on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. The beautiful part about that is I know the exact inputs to lead to 100 enrollments a month. It's 1,000 email course subscribers, which is the marketing goal. It's having enough slots on the calendar to enroll that many people, mm -hmm. which we currently don't have. And then it's having enough of a success team to fulfill on that. And so I've set goals within each of those that if we hit, and we talked about this on the last episode, it's unreasonable to not reach this main number if all three departments hit that number. So it's like an input mm -hmm. equation. And that's very freeing because you don't even have to worry about the high level goal. It's how do I just work with each department to make sure that they're hitting it and then everyone in that department knows this is my only responsibility and this is how it connects to achievement of the high level. Yeah, you can see you know, with stuff like this, because um, we'll give feedback, feedback and input on other people's businesses all the time. And so often I'll notice that someone will set the high level goal and then they won't nail down the inputs the only input is, I guess I need to work harder. Mm. And there's no real clarity over, no, what specifically needs to happen? Like it's it's very simple, increase enrollments for PGA, we need more people enrolling in the free educational email course. Mm -hmm. Like that's the only number that you should be thinking about. Um, and so whenever you're setting goals, it's like, how can you reverse engineer the specific actionable, tangible input? Um, and another framework that's really crystallized for me over the past couple of years is like, if at any point your strategy for growth is to work harder, you don't have clarity. Mm -hmm. It should never, it's not usually an effort thing. Mm -hmm. It's a focusing on the right thing. And then if you, in order to ramp any one of those, it can't be dependent on you or I being like, well, I guess we need to wake up an hour earlier each day. Like that's not the solution. Mm -hmm. And what we found instead is, okay, the way this process works is, set the goals, and then those goals, we learned this uh, from Tom Bilyeu. Th those goals oh, yeah. create demands, which is a very interesting idea, but it's really those goals create projects to hit. Mm -hmm. And so within PGA, to hit a 1,000 EEC subs, we're at like a 700 run rate. So what is that delta? I've been thinking of all the different ways we could do that, and this is basically our process. For each of these goals, we lay out as many different ways we could achieve that and try to pick the low-hanging fruit. We talked about this one probably six weeks ago mm -hmm. in, okay, these are all the different ways we could reach a thousand EC subs and how can we go kind of take small steps in front of them? So we're trying Twitter ads, LinkedIn ads, newsletter ads, more top of funnel organic content. All of that is a hypothesis of how do we get to a thousand? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to operate that over the next six weeks. And then if we get there, it will be deemed a success and we'll double down on one of those channels. But that goes the same way with success and sales. It's okay to hit that number. What does that department need to take on? Mm -hmm. And then prioritizing. I think that is of all setting these goals is one thing, but then the prioritization of the projects that lead to that is the more difficult part. I was probably where we take on too much. Yeah, totally. I So I tweeted this recently. I think this is one of the best standalone tweets I've, I've come up with in the past two years, I keep thinking about it, is most people set too many goals. And the reason they set too many goals is to avoid the boring work required to make progress on any one of them. And mm. this, like, this is the easy part. Mm -hmm. The easy part and the fun part is creating the big, like, fig fig jam board, yeah. you know, where it's like, oh, these are the seven different products. This is what my empire is going to look like and everything's going to lead to this and I'm going to upsell people on this. And like, that is easy and that's very fun. Uh, but in order to actually not even bring the whole thing to life, bring one of those components mm. to life, you have to do nothing but think and work on that one thing for a prolonged period of time. 
And so even if you look at this whole list, like, yes, you know, now we have a team and so there are some things we can do in parallel, but really it's pick one of those. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, we want 100 enrollments per month at PGA. We're probably going to need to do nothing but think about how to increase that last 35% delta of hitting 1,000 weekly EEC, EEC subs exclusively. Exclusively, right. And, and everything this is, else. This is one goal of the four different businesses that we're trying to, and right. this is us working it out out loud that we're trying to take on too many things once again. Yep. But the realization, and this is where I think a lot of it is just these lessons sink in more and more over time, the more things that you build, you can end up building that whole empire. I have no doubt we will end up building that mm -hmm. whole picture this year. But if you try and do it all at the same time, A, you don't end up making any meaningful progress on any of them. And then B, the progress that you do make, because it's not happening in one container, it's happening spread out across four containers, it makes your life more and more difficult and complicated because now you're creating all of these problems where your effort isn't focused. Mm. So you can build the empire, but you will get there much faster and with much less stress if you just focus on building one individual piece at a time. Or counterpoint, it shows where we lack leverage. Also, the yeah. The fact that we're not able to pursue all of these at the same time. Yep. If you had heads of each of these, you actually could, mm -hmm. right? With a with more leverage, we can come up with these high level goals. And that was why it was a helpful exercise because to do everything we wanna do with PGA and then also hit these ship 30 goals, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult because we are the the throat to choke for each of these numbers. Great and each, point. Each person can only have one number is what I'm slowly, Peter Thiel talks about this. It's like you have one number for every person in the company that they are responsible for. Mm -hmm. And so we have, we don't really have that for any of these. We are that for all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? this is... Um, Except for right with AI, which is, a, right. which is a great counterpoint and worth us talking about the way we've been building that with Justin and then we can talk about Chip30. Yeah, the... The th it's hard because with it, with info products, especially, you know, it's, it's a very high margin business. And I think you and I have, you fall into the trap of thinking, okay, these, these businesses are throwing off cash and then you almost like talk yourself out of reinvesting because mm. that, that doesn't impact anyone else's quote unquote paycheck on our team, except for ours. Like when we hire someone new, our paycheck goes down mm -hmm. for a period of time. You know, we have to figure out how to use that asset. And so it's interesting because you, the short term is like, oh, we can extract more cash out of this business by you and I just have to work a little harder, mm -hmm. not realizing that you're denying yourself the next piece of leverage and you basically have a glorified job, mm. you know, like right now we're making all these changes to ship 30 and literally I'm telling myself, well, I guess I got to cancel all my plans for the next two weekends because I'm just going to grind 10, 12 hours a day and do all of this. Uh, that should be a signal. Like, yeah, you can do that in the beginning, but that should be a signal. Okay, your strategy for growth is work harder. Mm. And like that can only take you so far. Right. You know, so what's cool about this is it reveals, like you said, where we lack leverage and where we would probably get the highest return. So the the juxtaposition here is to look at Chip 30 and Ride with AI. Because mm. so Ride with AI, I said our one goal here is to make a sale of our back end product to all of our paid subscribers. So the easiest way, it's almost worth zooming out one level. It's when I think about setting this high level business goal, it's how can we increase revenue of that business? period, full stop, mm -hmm. like what is the one number? And we could very easily for Right With AI have a paid subscriber goal. Like we wanna grow 20% from this to this. Mm -hmm. But instead, I like the goal being, let's maintain the current run rate, whatever we're doing there, mm -hmm. and instead sell something additional to the back end of that customer base. Yep. And here's the juxtaposition Real quick too, yeah. I think why that makes so much sense is because Right With AI doesn't have its own lead acquisition channel. Right With AI is basically a dividend on our own channels. Mm. And we 
promote lots of different things. Like mm -hmm. we have tweets about PGA, mm -hmm. we have tweets about Chip30, we have tweets about Right With AI. If Right With AI had its own front end lead acquisition, it had a growing Twitter, it had a growing LinkedIn, then you're like, oh, you know what? We might not need the back end yet because we can ramp the front end, but we don't have a front end basically, mm -hmm. or a front end like marketing vehicle. So because we don't have that, it actually, from a build order perspective, makes a lot more sense to go, well, right with AI is doing 300K a year. Why don't we just extend the LTV and put a secondary product? And it also shows where we lack leverage because we can't ramp this one. Right. Like we can't increase it because it just requires us to tweet more about it. Yes. Which doesn't work as well. Uh huh. Right. So build order for right with AI, we we mm. are building with Justin, who is pretty much the the head of right with yeah. AI, right? We he runs does the everything. writing, runs everything. So we're able to, from a leverage perspective, go, okay, we think the goal should be this. Let's go make that happen. He is now head of marketing sales and success uh -huh. for all of the different right with AI things. So it's actually that he lacks leverage. Yep. Because he can't make marketing go up because he has to go build that product. Mm -hmm. Ah, right. Yeah. And so you're it, responsible it's, for both. It's bottlenecks all the way down where we are the just in limitation of the portfolio. Uh huh. Right. It's like, oh, we can't do this one. So it's like a meta example of why are we, one, able to not say you need to clear your whole weekend because you need to go build the Right With AI product. Right. We have leverage there. But why does Justin have to go, okay, I need to go clear my entire weekend because uh -huh. he lacks the leverage <laughs> to then build that thing, right? So Ship30 and Right With AI, almost the same exact business at this point in terms of uh, goal. Like mm -hmm. They're both make one sale of yep. this thing. But- one of them you are now the head of and responsible for everything. Yep. And then in the other, you're not. So yeah, just to give a little context. <laughs> so Right With AI has been a fascinating business for, for us, but I'll just say for me, because especially with something like writing, it's so easy to fall into the, it's the opposite of surgeon in the room. Like with writing, you think no one can do what I do, mm. you know? And right with AI is really the first time, I guess I experienced this a little bit with my ghostwriting agency. It was really the first time where we came up with this idea, like what's the highest leverage part of right with AI as a newsletter? The highest leverage part was A, coming up with the idea for the newsletter itself, coming up with the positioning, coming up with the value of each newsletter, coming up with what's in it for the reader slash customer, right? It's the framing of the product itself. That's mm -hmm. the highest leverage. And the second highest leverage is coming up with the individual ideas, right? So, okay, right with AI is here's a writing idea slash framework and here's the chat GPT prompt. Well, the highest leverage component of that isn't actually the writing, it's coming up with the, what's the most interesting idea and then how would you design a prompt around it? So you and I, we've told this story, we were in Cabo a year ago. We came up with the idea for Write With AI. Mm. While we were there, literally between mastermind sessions, we wrote the first couple issues. On the plane, right? yeah. So the highest leverage, we came up with the idea for the product and we wrote the first couple issues to create the template essentially for it. And then the reason this has been so fascinating is we ended up um, hiring a writer who has been in our ecosystem forever and going, okay, we've already done the highest leverage components. So now we'll provide a lot of the ideas in the frameworks because mm -hmm. they're things that we've created and already thought through and already written about. Your job is to take that and A, create a prompt for it and B, um, then clean up like the writing itself of how do you distribute this idea. And that has taught me so much about how that's how every one of our businesses should run. Mm -hmm. And especially because I play a lot of the role like, okay, we're overhauling ship 30. I'll go write 30 emails, mm -hmm. you know? And in reality, I shouldn't be doing that mm -hmm. because A, I've already written every single one of those emails a hundred times, <laughs> right? So I'm not learning anything new. And B, because everything in those emails is trainable. Surgeon in the room, mm -hmm. right? The surgeon doesn't need to put the IV in. The surgeon doesn't need to do the stitches. The surgeon doesn't need, right? The surgeon comes in for one thing. And really it's the idea. It's what should each email be about, mm -hmm. right? The positioning of each email. So anyway, all of that to say is this has just taught me a lot about um, 
the components in our business where we think no one can do what we do. And in reality, mm. it's all of those things are very trainable. And anytime you are doing something, you have to ask why you're the one doing it. I've yet to find something that is not trainable. Yeah, to be honest, I haven't either. It's just a spectrum of how trainable is it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not whether it is or not. It's writing an email is far more trainable than goal setting of the entire business. Right. But still trainable mm -hmm. eventually. So talking this out loud, right with AI, it's build this, but then we should probably start to find a social ghostwriter to run an AI writing. Totally. We tried to do that with Justin, but again, he couldn't do it all himself. Right. Right. And now we have the margin to play with on that business itself, mm -hmm. looking at it saying, okay, w especially this will extend LTV enough that it actually makes perfect sense to hire someone to do the front end marketing because we have built in enough margin to do that. Mm hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. So yeah, other goals within that marketing, it's add this many EEC subs a week, which I don't know what our current run rate is, but I want Justin to set a goal around that. Same with sales, increase new paid subs to X per week and then reduce churn. But again, all of those he actually can't do. So it's just needs to be that one. Yep. But we should have clarity around what these are on a weekly basis. So then what's your thought, just talking through this, I mean, what's your thought then on, so you have one person responsible for marketing, one person responsible for sales, one person responsible for success. Who are, who's responsible for all of them? Is it us for every business or no, is there? It, it's just, it's Justin for that business. Like he is the CEO of right with AI. Yeah. Right. That's we the, have a, the ultimate at the end of the day. Like we are the CEOs of PGA ship 30 velocity and right with AI. Not really. It's mm -hmm. like right with AI is the most tangible example of a portfolio company. Yep. Which is the goal, right? All of these should be portfolio companies as we ascend. Yeah. Which is, it forces you to create in a certain way. Yes. You have to build it in a certain way to ever get there, mm -hmm. which is removing yourself from all the fulfillment, from the marketing, from all of that. Yep. And we'll get there. I think as we transition ship 30 from cohort based to always on mm -hmm. immediate cohort based, like weekly cohort based is kind of how we're thinking about yeah. it. Uh, that's one of the other goals, but it's so interesting to put that out there. Like, are we going to be able to do this and actually pursue this goal of PGA hitting? Yeah. I can, the thing is, it's like figuring out what parts of the business each of us are sinking our teeth into at any given time. Yeah, we can work in parallel with some of On these some things. some of that, yeah. So Ship 30, because we don't have anything for sale, it's put Ship 30 always yeah, on for sale. And then setting marketing sales and success goals are all just the inputs that allow it to be made for sale. Mm -hmm. But you could see in six months, it's going to be make X, Y, Z number of sales. Okay, how do we do that? We need to increase the Same number of VC subs to get sales. We need to increase the conversion of all that attention and then success. It would be improve the product in some way. Mm -hmm. If we are the ones that have to go and do that, it's not going to grow as fast as if we had someone who was in charge of running all of Ship 30. I have one conversation with them at the beginning of the quarter saying, here are the goals let's go figure out a game plan to operate this. Do you have enough leverage to go pursue all of these? If not, let's figure out how to right. get you that. Yeah, you know what would be interesting as you sort of go through this exercise too is looking at what the potential math looks like for each one of these verticals. If you have someone responsible for marketing, for sales, for success, and then a quote unquote CEO for that vertical, you know, what what is the expected labor cost? Mm -hmm. And what's the expected margin? And right. what what would be a this is a healthy business in our portfolio? Mm. You know, because mm -hmm. um, I think part of the challenge, and I fall into this trap all the time, is like, you know, like we know if we hire a social ghostwriter for Write with AI, over the long term, it will probably make money, and we be will net find positive. a way to make, make it, it net, yeah positive. We will find a way, but because in the short term we lack the clarity of, okay, well, what is that cost? What would be that cost over a year? Like, what is that investment? Mm -hmm. And how long do we anticipate? It's like thinking like a private equity firm. It's mm -hmm. like, how long do we anticipate until we see a return on that investment? Mm -hmm. And because that requires three levels of questions deep, you sort of just default to, ah, let's not spend the money. Mm -hmm. And then the cycle repeats and then we end up going, it's, well, we'll just work harder. Yeah, it's every single hire in here. Yep. 
is the same question. Yep. And then the funny part is like the reason you might do that or not do that is has nothing to do with the business, but might be your personal life. Uh huh. Like what's going on there? What are your demands? Your time? Like are are you able to hire someone? Are you in a a period where you want higher income versus reinvestment? Mm -hmm. It's a all encompassing game. This you is know? so. My first job out of college was I worked at this ad agency. And one of the things that we would do is we would build, uh, this was, you know, right when Instagram was booming in popularity. Everyone wanted to be on Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook ads had just come out, and, you know. And so one of the things we would do is we would build these content strategies for companies. It could be everything from a local restaurant to a multi-billion dollar company. And I... One of the most interesting things that I learned in that period is every single company or client goes, what are all the things we could do? Mm -hmm. And then we would go spend eight months going, well, here's your Snapchat strategy and here's your Twitter strategy and here's your Facebook strategy. And then we'd give it to them. And then at the very end, they'd be like, oh, well, we can only do like 10% of those because our budget is, you know, five grand a month or our budget is 30 grand a month. So they, everyone wants to know what are all the things we can do and they completely ignore the context of, but what can you allocate? How much money can you allocate? How much time can you allocate? How much effort can you allocate? How much bandwidth mm. on your team can you allocate? And so part of what's interesting about the goal setting is, yeah, it's not just the constraints within the business. You know, it's like how, how much are we comfortable reinvesting right now? Mm -hmm. There's a number, you know, and, and we need to know what that number is. And also it also sits in the context of your life. Mm -hmm. Like right now, are you optimizing for taking cash out of the business and padding your own bank account? Mm -hmm. I see this with all the people in our, in this early group for the mastermind after PGA. Like each one of them is like, what should I do next? And the first question I ask is, well, how much money have you pulled out of the business? What's mm -hmm. your personal net worth? Because mm -hmm. you don't want to ramp up risk when mm -hmm. you haven't pulled out, and that was the mistake I made, when mm -hmm. you haven't pulled out any money and your net worth is eight grand, mm -hmm. you should be pulling money out of the business. You shouldn't be like tripling down. Mm -hmm. So, so much of this too is in the context of like what's going on in our life right now. If we were to hire four new people, mm -hmm. that would take all of our bandwidth, right. which means we can't do something else. So we've set this goal through May 15th because that is kind of the- The first D-Day? The first the, <laughs> the natural- somewhat transition period where you're going to be moving to well no i'm traveling and you're traveling yes that's right that's and then right. i'm gonna i'm gonna be moving the following month right and that is just going to be a hectic time yeah of time where we will not be able to hire period mm -hmm. full stop start new all, projects really do much like that june june is kind of a wash mm -hmm. it's almost worth looking at june is like a full maintenance mode month. Yeah. Our goal up until June should be how do we give everyone on the team everything they need so they aren't blocked because we're going to, I mean, our lives are just, it's all up in the air, you know, and I'm going to be moving across the country again. And so, yeah, how do we not become, again, going back to this, we are responsible for seven of those different roles. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure we aren't the bottleneck during those moments of transition hmm. so they can keep working. Right. You know, like the easiest one we I, like the most top of mind is we've started ramping YouTube. Okay. If I don't, if I'm not proactive and I don't script and record two months worth of videos before I go move. Okay. I, we, the, we get taxed twice. We don't have videos coming out, which means channel stops growing, which impacts mm -hmm. traffic. And then we have, a team member who's full time who now doesn't have anything to work on. Mm -hmm. So now you get double taxed because you didn't set things up in a certain way. And that is going to happen across like every, every vertical. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure that we aren't the bottleneck. And luckily we know what that is. It's make sure that you're ahead on YouTube, mm -hmm. which the bottleneck to that is a script writer. Yep. So today we should <laughs> Literally figure today. out what we could do about hiring a script writer yep. so that you can continue to run all this ship 30 new stuff and have someone working in parallel. Cause you got to experience that with Ash on some of the email build out for 
ship 30. Mm -hmm. It's like completely you, you so helpful. Exactly. And so that's done and Excel, that's two days of work, Yep. you know, cut out just by zooming out for a second and saying, okay, what are the pieces that actually could already start to build this? And then the one we didn't talk about was velocity, which is the back end of PGA, which I can talk a little bit about mm -hmm. kind of the, the vision for this. It's if PGA is zero to one as a ghostwriter, velocity is how do you build your own ghostwriting agency? So it's you're at five, 10, and you want to get to 20, 25 a month. The way I look at this piece is I see a lot of other people in this space creating productized service agencies. Mm. So it's design, it's ghostwriting, it's all these other things. And they're trying to monetize their the service, their brand through the delivery of a service and saying, I can help drive traffic to that thing and then fulfill on it. I think that's going to work. It, it, it will works be stressful to a degree. and will be lower margin than I think they'd like. And there's mm -hmm. a bunch of different, but a lot of people are doing it well. However, I think you can instead say, what is the end result I am trying to get here? And so let's just take a design agency. If you were to try to build a massive design agency to $10 million a year, you might have to work with whatever, 100 clients a month or something like that. The amount of operational complexity that would create to fulfill on 100 different clients with all different requests and things like that is much higher. Mm -hmm. All that's happening though is 100 clients are getting the design that they want, period. That's the end goal. Mm -hmm. If instead of building a productized service agency, you built a education business around helping individuals build solo design agencies and show them how to go fulfill on that demand, you're still achieving the same goal, achieving the same goal but the amount of operational complexity required to educate that many people is way lower than fulfilling on that many clients. Yep. And so I look at velocity of if you and I were gonna say, let's go build a $10 million ghostwriting agency, what would we sell? How would we acquire clients? And how would we fulfill on it? And then again, marketing, sales, success, same same thing all the way down, Yep. right? What would be the things we built there? White label it to as many individuals as possible who've already shown that they do wanna take this path, have built the fundamental skill of getting to five to 10K with one or two clients and then they can go and fulfill on that end demand that we could still help generate traffic and demand for. Yep. So that's kind of my two paths, all delivering the same end result. Which game do you want to play? Do you want to be managing 100 different clients all wanting different things? Or do you want to be educating 100 individuals on how to fulfill that demand on their own? Mm -hmm. That I think that mental reframe is so insanely powerful. And I think it's very hard for many people to wrap their head around what you just said. I'll say it, <laughs> I, I do, I do. Uh, I'll say it in the opposite because this might help ground it. Um, I think about the Hormozy story where he started hanging out with Russell Brunson and he was opening all these gyms. Mm. And then Russell goes, you have level 10 knowledge, you're in the wrong opportunity vehicle. And he changes the vehicle from service to instead of me operating all these gyms and helping with all of these launches myself, I'm going to go train other people on how to improve their gym, mm -hmm. right? And then business explodes and it's a 10 out of 10 opportunity vehicle. The same exact thing is true here where I have level 10 knowledge. Mm -hmm. I was in a really inefficient uh, opportunity vehicle, built a ghostwriting agency the way that the agency was structured was basically an umbrella of micro agencies. We would have a writer and an editor paired together and that writer editor would be responsible for eight to 10 clients. That's literally a micro agency within an agency. And that is an inefficient opportunity vehicle because the more you scale subjective work, more operational complexity. Group coaching and training individuals on how to create micro agencies is achieves the same goal. It's literally the same exact thing, except instead of us being an agency, we are a, a trainer of micro agencies. Mm. And I think so many other creators that are trying to monetize with a service don't understand. It all goes back to what we were saying. I now, like I love the fact we have PGA because I'm going to hire a gazillion ghostwriters because mm -hmm. our biggest bottleneck is like, I shouldn't be creating things anymore. Mm -hmm. I should be going, this idea 
is going to crush. This is how this idea should get structured. Here's generally what's in it. You go do 95% of the labor. You know, I think this is the gold mine that Ali is sitting on. Yeah. Ali Abdal with his YouTube completely rather than creating a productized service that helps individuals create their own YouTube, educate individuals on how to start their micro YouTube agencies. Yep. Same end result, but one. Yeah. Yeah. Cause absolutely what's, crush. what's the highest leverage component of his skill? It's not the service component. It's knowing it's the knowledge right? It's everything we talk about with AI. Like it's the thinking, not the doing, right? It's the knowledge of what is required to be successful on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So you should go train other people to do that rather than you doing it yourself. And it's the same difference between Ship 30 and PGA where Ali has the part-time YouTuber Academy, which is people who want to be YouTubers themselves. He needs the paired education vehicle of don't be a YouTuber yourself, be an editor and YouTube consultant for other people who want to be on YouTube. Right. And it's same the same exact idea. And the same, it's the same argument where, that we make where it's like, yes, if you had a YouTube channel that blew up, if your writing blows up, uh, in theory, you will, your ceiling's a lot higher. Mm -hmm. You could make a lot more money, but that takes a lot longer. Yes. What's your fastest path to 10 grand a month? It's monetize your talents with a service ghostwriting, mm -hmm. or it's monetize your talents with video as an editor, mm -hmm. right? Same exact Thing. And you can apply this to literally every industry, mm -hmm. but everyone, I think the reason why everyone defaults to the service component is because thinking about how to train other people to think is actually quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier to just go, oh, I'll do it for you. But you don't realize that in doing that, your ceiling comes down dramatically. Mm -hmm. All right, Ollie, we'll build this for you if you're listening. <laughs> I'm yeah, add it to the list. But seriously, if we wanted to do that, we would then do the same exact exercise here, which would be setting a goal, re realizing we lacked leverage, having to go and hire leverage yep. of one person to run that. And then we can instill, install the systems that we built for PGA right into that. And what's our highest leverage component? Our highest leverage component is going, that's the opportunity, mm -hmm. right? So being able to spot the opportunity, going, this is how it should be positioned, it's the positioning of it. And then it's very high level, like here are the benefits and here's uh, how it's structured, like mm -hmm. sort of the general design of like the quote unquote product. And then everything else from there is incredibly inefficient for me to sit there and write. Like there's no nobility in me sitting there going, oh, I wrote every paragraph on this landing page. Mm -hmm. None. None. Who cares? I've already acquired that skill. I, I know how to do it. It's inefficient for me to keep doing it. Just like it's inefficient for a surgeon to be the one being like, well, before we do your surgery, we're going to take your blood pressure. Mm. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we're just continuing to learn this lesson because as much as we're talking about this now, nothing's going to change over the next six weeks. We're <laughs> yeah, going to go and yeah. play every single one of these friggin' roles. <laughs> yeah. It's like, great episode. Cool. I'm still going to grind all weekend. Yeah, exactly. And if there's one meta takeaway from us doing these lessons every single week. It's like awareness of the lesson doesn't necessarily mean you're going to change anything um, immediately. <laughs> immediately. Yeah. Right. We do eventually want to get to, okay, cool. We thought of this idea. It goes back to the becoming more powerful being the one thing, like my personal core value that I'm trying to embody right now is becoming more powerful, which is going from idea in your head to implemented thing in the real world as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. We lack power because we cannot say, hey, Ali, you should have a group education program. Yeah, and he says yes, and we and go, like, it's done. Right, exactly. Yeah. So we'll get there. Quick life updates? Yeah, congrats. I, I think uh, I bought a house. You think so? It's not officially across the, the finish line, but I but they accepted the offer, and we are in process, and Hell now yeah. you know we're doing like a full physical on my entire life in order to <laughs> <laughs> purchase it. We but, talked about this at the end of the last episode with like, you weren't sure if you were going to buy it. Now you're running the math on some of the different things, but hell yeah, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited pumped. about it. I, I'm I pumped think to visit. I just want to play golf there. Uh, yeah, so it's right on a golf course. And uh, I'm very, I said the first thing I'm buying is my own golf cart so that I can just park it in the garage and go right from the driveway onto Sick. the course. So dope. That'll dude. be cool. Um, but I want to state for the record that I am in the camp of buying a primary residence like this is a I'm not going to say horrible investment, but it is a break-even investment, best maybe case. at, ba at yeah. best. Um, buying a primary residence like this is purely a, an emotional decision. Mm -hmm. It's like, I want you know, I want to start a family. I want to be grounded somewhere. I want some place to call home. So 
have stability. Yeah. So I just no nobody hit me in the comments being like, that's a horrible financial decision. I know. Yeah. I know. Personal for me, not much going on. No? I mean What's your next trip? Next trip wedding in Spain? is a wedding in Spain. That'll be fun. So that's kind of the, I'm cutting my lease here. This is another reason we set the goals at the end of May. You're headed to Europe. I'm headed to Europe. I'm mm-hmm. going to spend June in Amsterdam working. I'm very interested to see what we're doing at that time mm-hmm. and how I can structure my day. Having that quiet six hours in the morning before anyone wakes up might be a big content push, but it might also just be a, I don't know. Just managing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So hmm. we'll see how that goes. And then the decision in the middle of the summer of what we build. Mm. We talked about that a little bit this morning, but we're gonna grab uh, Italian food tonight. Oh, with our with our better halves. <laughs> and uh, if no one knows, um, Contessa in Miami, best Italian food. Unreal. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah, I've been battling a little bit of a stomach bug the last two days, but um, the lamb chops are going. The down lamb chops way. are going down your <laughs> way. I'm, I'm gonna pay for it one day, one way or another. You know, it's either gonna be the best thing or the worst things. Or both. Both. Or, or both. both. Or both. So that's all we got. Thanks everyone for watching, tuning in. If you're on YouTube, throw us a what uh, what do we want to make the secret word? Last time we made one, it was Medellin, then we did banana chips, then we did mm, How about golf course? Golf course. Use yeah, it in a sentence. Golf course in a sentence. Don't just say golf course. <laughs> People are still doing that every single time. Uh, I don't even know what the giveaway is just let us know you're watching this far if anyone's listened to us ramble for the last 35 minutes <laughs> we might trying surprise to figure out our something. business lives in some way uh if you find this useful one thing we do really appreciate is the or the personal dms people send i love when people are like out of nowhere that they're listening to espresso hour so Same. hit us up let us know because that informs some of the things we talk about too or the people who say this was useful i go okay what else would they find useful that's also useful to us so appreciate that if you're on spotify five star review screenshot it throw it on instagram all that good stuff We'll be back next week. Have a great week, everyone. Talk soon. See you. Peace.